so I am uh, happy to introduce uh, Jens uh, Eblaer uh, from uh, Antwerp University, uh, who is going to talk about toposes of species on, on monoids as generalized topological spaces. So it's a... Uh, you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, to all the organizers uh, for putting together a wonderful conference and uh, for the invitation. So I will talk about uh, toposes of pre-sheaves on monoids as a generalized topological spaces. So we will really try to see uh, how far we can push, push the analogy between uh, toposes in this very special case and a topological spaces. So it will, uh, the talk will be based on joint work in progress with uh, Morgan Rogers. And um, mostly the second part will be also based on joint work in progress with Aurelien Sagny. So the first part will, will be about ital geometric morphisms and their dual, the complete spreads. So uh, we will look at this in the special case uh, of pre-sheaf monoids, which is a joint work with Morgan Rogers. And we will build on uh, really a very large uh, theory that is worked out by uh, Bona and Funk. So uh, this is something we already saw earlier in, this, uh, in the school already and in the conference is that the sheave on a topological space can be equivalently described by a local homeomorphism to this space. So uh, here is uh, some reminder of the notion of local homeomorphism. Say that F is a local homeomorphism if you have an open covering of the source, the domain space, such that the restriction of this map to the open sets are homeomorphisms onto open sets for all uh, for all these open sets. So here uh, the, the condition that it is onto an open set is a bit uh, tricky, but it is uh, as necessary to include this, that it is onto an open set. And uh, we will use, instead of a local homeomorphism, we will use the terminology uh, et al. And uh, e, e, will called, e, e will be called the et al space associated to the sheaf. So here are some uh, examples of local homeomorphisms to the circle. So these can be thought of as uh, sheaves. So you can take an open interval of the circle. That's uh, the inclusion map is local homeomorphism. You can take the circle with double point. That's like a non hausdorff space, similar to the line with double points. But uh, this time it is a circle. And you take the projection to the circle. That's also a local homeomorphism. And a very well-known uh, local homeomorphism is the covering map from um, R to the circle here. So this gives a geometric interpretation of an object uh, to an object of uh, the topos. And we can take this a little bit further and think of the sheaf as not as an etal map of topological spaces, but as an etal geometric morphism between the associated toposes. And here we can say that an etal geometric morphism to this uh, topos is precisely the ones, the geometric morphisms that are induced by the local homeomorphisms of spaces. But there is an alternative characterization that can be extended to uh, other toposes. So the fundamental theorem of topos theory says that if E is a topos and X is an object in E, so X is a bit like a sheaf, then the comma category of E over X is a topos as well. So this category has as objects the maps uh, from Y to X for, uh, for X the fixed object. And the morphisms are, uh, as you might expect, they are the morphisms from Y to Y prime making the diagram commute. So it's a bit, for me, it was a bit strange to call this the fundamental theorem of topos theory at first, 
um, it gives a method to construct new toposes, but uh, it was not clear to me what was so fundamental about it. Um, but we will see later why it uh, is important. So uh, here is again the definition. A geometric morphism is a tile if and only if there is some object X in E and this uh, domain topos F is uh, equivalent to the slice topos over X. And well, the map F is uh, just uh, agrees with the projection map uh, by X here. So this is an uh, isomorphism. So uh, it really says that uh, etal geometric morphisms are exactly the projection maps from the slice topos. And here is a, a description of what is a projection looks like. You can uh, describe it by describing the in inverse image functor. And this is exactly taking the product with X. Uh, and the projection map to X is uh, the, the projection on the first component. So why are uh, these uh, slice toposes important? Well, by definition, there is a bijection between objects of the topos and etal geometric morphisms um, from uh, with the same codomain E. So these etal geometric morphisms are taken up to uh, natural isomorphism. And this extends to an equivalence of categories um, between E and the category of maps uh, to the topos E, uh, the category of etal maps to the topos E. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to be sure about this result. So uh, I looked it up in the literature uh, with the help of uh, Morgan. And I think at the moment, uh, the only result that I found, where only place where, that I found where it is stated is uh, in the literature on infinity topos. Um, so there's a proof by David Carcedi um, using the result from infinity toposes and then truncating it to a result about one toposes. But I think uh, now uh, from the talk by uh, Ricardo Zanfa, about the joint work with Olivia Caramello. It's now clear that this doesn't use infinity toposes and you also have a proof really uh, just in one topos theory. Um, so it, what's important is that here, the category on the right-hand side is a, it should be a two category, but uh, it turns out that there are no natural transformations or no non-trivial uh, natural transformations. So it is, it can be thought of as a one category and it is exactly the, the topos E. So how does it work for a monoid? We now look at the topos of pre-sheaves on a monoid N. Uh, and this uh, topos of pre-sheaves is exactly the category of right N set. So if n is commutative, you don't have to mention that it's right n sets, but for non-commutative monoids, it's important. And um, so I use the letter n because uh, it will be thought of as a codomain topos, so we can keep the letter m for the domain. And also because uh, a natural example is the natural numbers under addition. And then the topos that you get is a uh, the topos of different sets that uh, Ivan Tomasic uh, talked about uh, earlier this week. So you can keep in mind, for example, M, the, the natural numbers under addition. So it all topos is over this, uh, over this topos correspond to right N sets. And now how can we draw this? So uh, we want to do geometry, so uh, we make pictures. And um, we take this special example of the num natural numbers under addition. And the base space we will write as, uh, as this. <coughs> so it's uh, one element and the action of the monoids is uh, 
it acts by the, the successor and it acts uh, trivially on this point. And this, we can think of this as the base space. And then an adult topos over it is another um, set with an uh, N action. And for example, we can take two elements and uh, one element is sent to, this element is sent to the other one and this other one is sent to itself. So um, I, I really want to stress that these pictures uh, should be taken seriously and really they, they give a lot of information about of the geometry of the topos. For example, if you will look at the double cover of the original space, then what you do is uh, you just take the same base space uh, twice so this is a trivial double covering. And if you want to uh, take a non-trivial double covering, then you also take two elements, but they uh, swap. So these are two uh, covering spaces of uh, index two. So, uh, and now maybe it's a good time to uh, start making this more precise. So more formally, if you have a monoid N and X is a right N set, then we define the category of elements of X uh, with respect to N as a category with as objects, the elements of, of X. So that's why it's called category of elements. And as morphisms are the elements of the monoid, such that here this equation holds A N is equal to B. Um, so the morphisms are of this form here. And uh, further, there is a natural projection from the category of elements to the monoids, um, sending every element to the unique object in the monoids and every morphism to the element of the monoid that labels this morphism. And we see that for every element of the monoid and every element of, of X, there is a unique lift to, uh, to a map in the category of elements that goes to A. And categories with this uh, property are called discrete vibrations, or, or more precisely, it's the property of the functor. And every discrete vibration is of this form. Okay, um, so, and it then turns out that the etal geometric morphism given by slicing over the object X is exactly the same one as the geometric morphism that is induced by the projection functor from the category of elements to N. So we really can draw this category of elements and the toposes are then uh, just the categories of pre-sheaves on it. So this it's really how you would draw the the Cayley graph of the of the N set. So now uh, what happens if we take uh, X to be the monoid N itself with the uh, right N action given by multiplication? Well, um, for ex in our example of the natural numbers under addition, you get uh, this picture here. And notice that the arrows go in the other direction. So that, that's part of the more formal definition. <clears throat> um, okay, so that's what it looks like. And this is a general uh, construction. Uh, it's called the root topos, and it was uh, introduced by uh, Conan Konzani in 2019. And the root topos associated to a monoid N is the topos uh, root n, which is the pre sheaves on this category of elements of n over itself. And if n is left cancellative monoid, then uh, the root topos is equivalent to a uh, topos of sheaves on topological space. Uh, for example, in this uh, case, you have that uh, the topological space associated to the root topos will be uh, the natural numbers together with uh, pointed infinity. 
and uh, open sets will be the sets that are upwards closed and uh, contain at least one uh, natural number or are non or are empty. So, and um, we can also look at this uh, for the arithmetic side. If n is now the monoid of non-zero natural numbers under addition, then um, um, no, under multiplication. multiplication. You, yeah. you said addition. It's multiplication. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's under multiplication. Then uh, this topos. So I will. Uh, this topos is underlying topos of the arithmetic side by a uh, and cosine. And what happens in this case is that uh, it's the category of non-zero natural numbers and the morphisms are you have uh, exactly a morphism from M to N whenever N divides M. And another word for this is, uh, it's also called uh, Conway's big cell, which appears in a uh, paper uh, covers of the arithmetic side by my uh, PhD supervisor, uh, Yves Lebrun. Uh, so this is also how I got uh, involved in uh, topos theory in the first place. Uh, and so here is a picture of this uh, big cell. So the topology on the big cell is non hausdorff but uh, here we take the closest Hausdorff approximation and the red dots together give uh, then a topological space with a subspace topology of, uh, of the plane. And uh, the blue lines give the division relations, which are uh, also important to recover the original topology. So for example, here you see that uh, the <coughs> prime numbers, they uh, converge to one for this, uh, this Hausdorff topology. So uh, now ethyl geometric morphisms to uh, the to base topos, they correspond to uh, right end sets. So what happens now with uh, left end sets? So the question is, is there a dual to the notion of ethyl geometric morphism? And the answer is yes. And uh, this is studied uh, to, um, in uh, many papers by uh, Bung, Bunge and Funk. And uh, to get to this notion, we first have to look at the notion of spreads. So what is a spread? Well, um, we have a uh, growth and uh, F and E. And a spread is uh, a geometric morphism is a spread if the complemented sub-objects of objects of the form, well, objects are in the inverse image of an object of E, give a generatic family of F. So this is a generalization of inclusions because uh, for inclusions, we have that every, every object in F is of the form, the inverse image of an element of an object in E. So we don't even need to take complement and sub objects. Um, so that's why every inclusion is a spread. And also if we, <coughs> if we would change the definition and we would remove the, the assumption that, the, that you take only uh, complement sub objects, if you would take all sub objects, then you would exactly get the definition of a localic geometric morphism. So all spreads are uh, localic. Um, so uh, another example is uh, if you have the space uh, one, a half, a third, and so on, uh, converging to zero, um, then this space as subset of the real line is uh, a spread. So the inclusion map is a spread. And this is a spread for both the subspace topology and for the discrete topology on Y. So uh, it's uh, more general. So we can have a look at uh, which of the examples of ethyl maps are uh, spreads. 
So uh, the open interval uh, is a spread because it's an inclusion map. But the uh, circle with double point will not be a spread because um, you can uh, take here an uh, open interval. So suppose that you take the open set here that only contains the upper point at the, at the origin. Then um, if you want to write it as a sub object of uh, the inverse image of this, then uh, what happens is that it's not a complemented sub object because the, the complement is uh, not open. So uh, it doesn't work. It's a localic map, but it is not a, not a spread. And uh, here, the, if you look at the real line as a covering map to the circle, then it is a spread because, um, well, uh, it has a basis consisting of uh, these things here. And they are precisely a, a, a component of the inverse image of a of an open set in the base space. So there, uh, this R is a spread. And then the notion of complete geometric morphism is a bit more uh, complicated. So here uh, we take uh, F and E to be Grothendieck toposes with F locally connected. And um, if and we start with the geometric morphism, um, and we, then we construct a site from uh, from a site of E, and it's given by objects in E together with uh, or objects in a site for E together with the con uh, connected component. Um, So I won't say very much about his uh, definition. Um, maybe only the intuition behind it. So the intuition is that informally covering of, uh, of the inverse image always comes from a covering on the original open set in the base space. So you can extend the covering uh, upstairs to a covering in the base space for, uh, for any open set in the base space. Um, so it's a rather complicated definition maybe, but it's already a special case of the def definition by Buna and Funk because they give a more general definition uh, for uh, toposes over an arbitrary base topos whereas we are just working with Grothendieck toposes over uh, the topos of sets as base topos. So if you want to have a very general definition, then you have to look at uh, the work of Bonnet and Funk. So for example, their book, uh, Sing Singular Coverings of uh, Toposes. And then uh, you have to be more careful uh, with the definition. So uh, a covering uh, upstairs comes from a covering uh, on the base space. So now we can see that uh, that another one of our Atal maps will not be uh, complete. So it was a spread, the open interval, the inclusion of the open interval was a spread, but it won't be a complete spread. So the reason is, uh, suppose you take an open set here, an open interval, and then the pre-image will be uh, something like this, which is an, uh, also open. And we can uh, cover this by uh, open sets that do, uh, do not contain in some sense the, the point that is removed. But we cannot extend this covering to a covering on the base space because on the base space, um, so uh, here we all always have an open set containing this point that is missing upstairs. And so we ha will have here a half open interval happening here. So that's a bit the intuition behind it. And um, so the circle with double point was already not the spread, so it won't be a comp complete spread either. 
um, and the real line, the covering map, uh, will be a complete spread. So, and there is a process of uh, completing spreads. So every geometric morphism with a locally connected domain can be factorized as a pure geometric morphism followed by a complete spread. And if you apply this to spreads, then in particular, a spread factorizes as a pure spread followed by a complete spread. So uh, we have here, uh, this was a, a spread, the open interval. And then if you look at the completion, then you will get the closed interval. So we will add two points uh, there. And you can do the same with the, the circle with just one point uh, removed. But then you will see that you get uh, a point added on, on both sides. So on the left and on the right. So you get again a closed interval and there are uh, two points lying above the same point of the circle. Um, so the, this uh, notion is also inspired by a notion in a topology of a cut. And um, yeah, for, a, for example, you can look at a piece of paper and model this as a, a compact Hausdorff space in the, in the Euclidean space in R3. Um, so this is a compact Hausdorff space, but then if, if you do it in two, then uh, you still should get two uh, compact Hausdorff spaces. So in some sense, we have imagined adding here a boundary points on both pieces uh, of paper. So that's the same thing that, uh, that happens in this situation. Um, so uh, what if uh, if etal geometric morphisms correspond to objects of the topos, then what do complete spreads correspond to? And uh, the, they correspond to some notion by Lavier. And uh, the definition of Lavier is that uh, a distribution is a, a co-limit preserving functor from the topos to uh, the topos of sets. And uh, one thing that you can notice here is that an object of the topos is the same as a co-limit preserving functor from the topos of sets to the topos E. So distributions are already here dual to objects. And the result by Bona and Funk is that there is a correspondence between distributions on the topos E and complete press that have E as a codomain. So uh, what does this look like in our case? Uh, if we have uh, the topos of pre-sheaves, then distributions are the same thing as functors from C to the category of sets. And in particular, if E is pre-sheaves on the monoids, then distributions correspond to left M sets. Um, and now we should uh, describe what the associated complete spread is of this uh, distribution or uh, in other words, of this left M set. And again, we arrive at the category of elements, but uh, there are two categories of elements. There is one for uh, covariant functors and one for uh, contravariant functors. Um, and they are uh, different in some sense. So for N a monoid and Y a left N set, we define the category of elements of Y as the category with uh, as objects the elements of y and uh, again as morphisms uh, the elements n such that n a is equal to b so this is a bit different than the other category of elements and to distinguish them uh, we put uh, here n uh, on top of the integral sign and uh, for the other category of elements we take it uh, uh, below the integral sign um, so, so the morphisms all look like this. And uh, there is again some natural projection from this category of elements to N. And for every element of the monoid and every uh, A uh, element of the set, there's a unique lift 
uh, to a map starting in A and uh, going somewhere else, lifting uh, the element N. And um, this functor is uh, called the discrete of vibration and every discrete of vibration is of this form. So our distributions correspond to discrete of vibrations uh, while uh, pre-sheaves uh, correspond to discrete vibrations. So um, a complete spread associated to the left and set Y is then uh, this uh, geometric morphism induced by this uh, projection map or projection functor from the category of elements to N. And uh, one thing we can do now is uh, also define a dual to the root topos, um, which uh, Morgan and I call the co-root topos. And uh, the definition is uh, the same, but you take uh, the category of elements of uh, N as a left N set rather than as a, as a right N set. And so here I co root the co root topos of N. The map to the base topos will be a complete spread. Whereas uh, for the root topos, the map to the base topos is et al. So uh, what are now the, the points of the, of the pre sheaf topos on this category of elements? So uh, you can use the pure complete spread uh, factorization uh, by Bonnet and Funk. So if you have a point of the, of the base topos, uh, the pre-sheaves on N, then the points by the Oconasius uh, theorem are exactly the flat left N sets. Uh, so it, we call this a flat left N set A. And this uh, point factorizes to uh, the associated complete spread, so the completion of this point, so to speak, which is uh, this topos, the complete spread associated to A. And then um, uh, we need a factorization to uh, the topos here because we are looking at the uh, points of the topos there. And here, this uh, dashed arrow is uh, exactly given by a map from A to Y, uh, which is a map of left N sets. So in this way, you can show uh, that um, the points of these uh, topos on the category of elements or, um, for the left N sets Y are precisely the flat left N sets together with a morphism uh, from this flat left N set to Y. Y. So this uh, connects back to the uh, talk by uh, Axel Osmond. So um, about over toposes at the model. So uh, what uh, Bung uh, and Funk show is that the complete spread associated to a, to a point, so a flat distribution, they uh, give exactly the um, category of points, um, yeah, they are exactly the over topos as this model. So this uh, is only with models in va with values in the category of sets. If you want to look at uh, models in uh, in other toposes, then uh, I I don't know whether this still works, mm. um, or if there is something uh, similar that you can do. Mm. Okay, so the points are left and sets A together with the map from A to Y. And here, Y doesn't have to be a flat left and set, it works for a general left and sets. Okay, uh, so uh, the first two examples were not uh, complete spreads and this, um, covering map by the real line was a complete spread. So it's both et al and a complete spread. And this is not really a coincidence because uh, in our situation, if a geometric morphism is both a complete spread and et al, then it is a covering map. So what does covering map mean here is that uh, you have a, 
it, it is a morphism from F to E. And you have the fundamental group of uh, the topos E. And you can take a subgroup of the fundamental group and then uh, take this uh, pullback diagram. And then uh, F is exactly the pullback of this morphism here that you get from the inclusion of H into the fundamental group. So this is uh, exactly, it works in exactly the same way as uh, for topological spaces, you have a correspondence between uh, subgroups of the uh, subgroups of the fundamental group and connected covering spaces. And it works here exactly in the same way in some special cases, namely if, uh, if the base topos E is a uh, pre-sheaves on a monoid. And this was uh, shown by uh, Bonhe and Funk or more generally for connected pre-sheaf toposes. And it also works for, uh, for E, the topos of sheaves on a Hausdorff second countable connected topological manifold. And this was shown by uh, Funk and Tim Shatin. So uh, I have not been uh, very precise here. So the, the ones corresponding to subgroups will be exactly the connected covering maps, but you also have a uh, non-connected uh, covering maps and they correspond to uh, sets with an action of the fundamental group. But, uh, so this is corresponding to the set uh, There's a quotient set. Okay. So um, how does this with the fundamental group work yeah, for pre-sheaf toposes on a monoid? Well, uh, to get the topos of uh, pre-sheaves on the fundamental group, uh, you need to look at the locally constant objects or more generally, if you, uh, in more general situations, you may have to look at uh, sums of locally constant objects, but that's not necessary here. So you can look at the locally constant objects, and these are precisely the right n sets on which n x by bijections. Um, and the full subcategory on the locally constant objects is again a topos, and it's equivalent to the pre sheaves on the uh, group G, which is a groupification of N, so the closest uh, group to uh, the monoid N. And uh, if X is such a locally constant right N set, then we can also define a left N action by uh, just defining it as multiplication on the right, but first taking the inverse of the element. So multiplication by the inverse element. And uh, in this case, we get that for this uh, left N action, the two, uh, <coughs> the two categories of elements agree. So you will also get uh, the same geometric morphism, which will be both a complete spread and a tau. Um, okay, so let uh, N now be a monoid and extra right N set. And we want to look at uh, a geometric morphism associated to this right end set. And we want to classify etal geometric morphisms in the sense that we want to end up again with a topos of pre sheaves on a monoid. So, when is it again of the form uh, pre sheaves on a monoid? And this is precisely when, uh, in the category of elements, there is an element such that every other element is a retract of this one. And uh, you can write this out uh, algebraically as follows. There is an element X such that for every other element Y in X, there is some element U such that X U is uh, equal to Y. And here U is an element that is uh, has a right inverse. So we use this notation to say that it is only a right inverse and not necessarily a left inverse. And in this case, if uh, such a element exists, such that all other elements are retracts of it, 
Then uh, for this element X, we get that the topos of pre-sheaves on this category is the same as the topos of pre-sheaves on the monoid NX, where NX is the monoid of endomorphisms of this element, which is exactly uh, the elements of N that fix X. So now let uh, N be a monoid and Y a left end set. And we can do exactly the same thing for complete spreads rather than a tau maps. And um, the calculation is uh, exactly the same. So uh, this time there must be an element Y in Y such that uh, all other elements are retracts of it. And in uh, this kind of category of elements, this means that there is some element V with a left inverse uh, such that y is equal to vx. And again, we can then describe this uh, pre sheaf topos as a pre topos of pre sheaves on a monoid. And the monoid is again the, the elements that fix uh, y. And this doesn't really give a method of saying for a monoid map uh, phi whether it is et al or not, because uh, it starts from the base topos and then you construct uh, a toposes over it. But say that you start with the monoid map from M to N, and you want to know whether it induces an et al geometric morphism. Then we also uh, found some criteria to, uh, to determine whether this is et al. So phi must be injective. If you have elements A and AB, that are in the image, then B must also be in the image. And for every element of N, there must be some uh, right invertible element U, so that N times U is in the image. Uh, for example, you can check that these uh, conditions are all satisfied if you take the map from the natural numbers to uh, the periodic numbers that sends N to P to the N. So this induces an et al geometric morphism. And the picture for complete spreads is exactly dual. Um, so then you work with uh, elements that have a left inverse. And here you can uh, show that A is in the image if B and A times B are in the image. So now we will give some uh, examples arising from uh, arithmetic toposes for maximal orders that try to mimic the arithmetic side, uh, but for uh, certain rings that are called maximal orders. And this is joint work with uh, Aurélien Sagny. But uh, of course, we focus here on the, on the results that have to do with uh, complete spreads and the town maps. Um, so some background in their approach to the Riemann hypothesis, uh, Kohn and Konzani introduced in 2014 the arithmetic site. So it's the topos of pre sheaves on the non zero natural numbers under multiplication, equipped with a certain sheaf of semi rings. And this sheaf of semi rings is very important, but still the topos of pre sheaves is already very interesting. Um, for example, it was computed by Kohn and Konzani that the points of the topos, they are classified up to isomorphism by the double quotient uh, featuring the, the finite ideals. So uh, here uh, Z with a hat is the product of all over P, over all uh, p uh, integers. It's called the profinite integers. And then if you take this, uh, Profinite integers and you tensor with the rational numbers, then you get the finite ideals. So uh, it's profinite integers, but you allow uh, finite uh, uh, integers in the denominator. So uh, to define maximal orders, we take uh, R a Dedekind domain, <laughs> which is a field of fractions, a global field. Uh, K. So global field, it's a, uh, for example, number field, uh, which is an extension of the rational numbers. Um, or it's, 
you can take the fraction field of a of a curve, um, a smooth curve, or in a in characteristic p, or uh, extensions of that. Um, so a maximal order over R is now an R algebra lambda, such that lambda is finitely generated torsion free over R. And if you take the base change to the um, field of fractions, then um, you get a central simple algebra sigma uh, over K. So uh, lambda is a sub ring of uh, the central simple algebra sigma. And um, if suppose that uh, R is the integers, then all finitely generated torsion free uh, modules are free. So you really get a free module with the multiplication on it. Uh, so my examples, uh, the integers themselves are a maximal order. Uh, you can take uh, n times n matrices over the integers. Uh, you can take uh, polynomials um, in one variable over a finite field. You can take, uh, again, n times n matrices over this uh, polynomial ring. Um, you can also <coughs> look at the Gaussian integers. And um, this is a case that was uh, already uh, studied by uh, Arien Sagny uh, very early on. Um, uh, so as a general to generalize the arithmetic side to uh, by replacing the integers by uh, the Gaussian integers. Or we can also look at another example of maximal orders is the, the Hurwitz quaternions. Um, and I gave a definition here. So they are the quaternions with uh, such that the coefficients are either uh, integers or they are um, integers plus one half. And, and for a general maximal order, we write um, <coughs> the non-singular elements are exactly the elements that become invertible in the um, in the central simple algebra. Okay. Uh, can we, some questions are, can we associate an arithmetic side to maximal orders? Uh, for example, as an underlying topos, is it a good idea to take the pre sheaves on the non-singular elements of the monoids? Or do we need a different topos? Or what is the right structure sheave of semi-rings uh, on this topos? Do we, and maybe do we get a spectral interpretation of the zeta function of the maximal order in uh, topos theoretic terms? Uh, so the spectral interpretation uh, is already uh, done um, in relation to the arithmetic side uh, by Conning Konzani, but it would be uh, nice to have a spectral interpretation also for uh, general maximal orders. But uh, this, this topic is, uh, needs uh, work and uh, will not be, uh, I will not talk about this already in this talk. Um, so uh, if we are being very precise, then the arithmetic side will not be a special case uh, of uh, this uh, process of looking at maximal orders because the closest approximation to the arithmetic side is a pre sheaves on this, uh, the non-singular integers. So how can we recover this, uh, the arithmetic side from this? So the, the answer is we look at the uh, following uh, set with an action of uh, Z and S. So minus one acts, so you have two elements and minus one switches the two elements and if you have a uh, positive natural number, then it acts uh, trivially on, on both elements. So this uh, is a set where every element acts by bijections. So uh, we are in a good situation where we have both a complete spread and a net down map at the same time. So, and we can compute that this category of elements is uh, equivalent to the category of uh, 
the, the monoid of non-zero natural numbers. So yeah, to, this is because minus one is an uh, automorphism between the two objects. And in this way, we get that uh, the arithmetic site or rather the underlying topos is a twofold covering space of, uh, of this topos that is more uh, generally associated to the maximal order C. Um, so can we get uh, this ID for more uh, covering spaces? Um, we can look at the maximal order lambda and uh, look at the profinite elements. So we look at the piadic completion at each uh, 8 one prime ideal and uh, take the product over all the primes. And these are the profinite elements. And then to define the lambda ideals, you again tensor with the fraction field. And uh, we can look again at the non-singular elements, which are the elements that become uh, invertible in the ideal ring. And there's, uh, the monoid is more complicated, the monoid of profinite integers in some sense, but the topos is uh, nicely behaved. If you take the completion, so the root topos, for example, is a spectral space. So it means that it's a coherent topos. And this is not necessarily true for the topos of pre-sheaves on the monoid lambda itself. For example, for lambda equal to this uh, ring, it already fails uh, because it does not have unique factorization. And then you, uh, there is a problem and it is not a, a coherent topos anymore. Um, so to go from uh, this completion to the original maximal order, we can look at the right uh, set, um, the set of uh, the finite adels. So the, the adels uh, depend on lambda. You take the units and you quotient out by uh, the units in sigma. So uh, I use notation that deals with sigma uh, below it, but uh, it does depend on lambda. So I, I mean the same thing. And the action is given by multiplication on the right. And again, this is an action by bijection. So we have a covering space. Um, and we are in the situation where we have a covering map, so both a complete spread and a detail map. And the associated uh, category is this uh, category of elements. So uh, they both coincide. And can we give a more concrete description? Well, uh, in the category of elements, uh, two objects are isomorphic if they are related by a unit. So uh, a unit in the profinite uh, Profinite elements of the maximal order. Um, and that's exactly because multiplication in this monoid in the category of elements is multiplication in the monoid. So the isomorphisms in the category of elements will exactly be the units in the monoid. And so the objects of the category of elements are classified up to isomorphism by the double quotient, like this. And this is exactly the ideal class group. So uh, you get that uh, if you look at the objects of this uh, category of elements up to isomorphism, then uh, the number of objects is exactly the number of elements in the ideal class group. And there's also a special element, uh, so the clause of one. And the endomorphism monoid of this element is exactly the original maximal order lambda, the non-singular elements. And other elements, you can also look at anamorphism monoids of other elements, and they can have uh, anamorphism monoids that is uh, the non-singular elements of another uh, maximal order, lambda prime. Um, so this gives uh, one application of this uh, covering maps. Uh, so here is another uh, application. So, um, we will restrict to uh, to the case where lambda is integers to keep it uh, a bit more simple. And the points of this uh, this topos is classified up to isomorphism by the double quotient. 
involving the finite Adels. And um, the question is now, is there an alternative topos where the finite Adels get replaced by the full ring of Adels? So uh, the full ring of Adels, to get that, you have to multiply the finite Adels with the real numbers. Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, so this was already uh, done in 2015 by uh, Conan Konzani by uh, looking at the scaling side. Um, so I, I won't talk about the scaling side here, but I will try to describe a scaling site where we uh, take the discrete topology on the real numbers. So in the scaling site, you really have a topology on the real numbers, the, the usual Euclidean topology which is uh, relevant to define the scaling site. But here we try to forget the topology on the real numbers to get a, a much more simplified uh, a picture. And uh, so how we do this is by looking at uh, real numbers as a set under, under uh, with an action of uh, ZNS, the non-singular integers. And um, we then look at the associated covering map. So why is this a covering map? Exactly because the action is again by bijections. So both a complete spread and an etal map. And the, the points of this topos, so I, um, as I mentioned earlier, it is an over topos. So the points of this topos are given by flat sets, a flat left ZNS sets A, together with the map from A to R. And this, this must be a map of uh, left ZNS sets. And uh, you can use this description uh, as an over topos at the model um, to show that this, uh, the points are then classified up to isomorphism by this double quotient, where you have the full ring of Adels rather than uh, just uh, finite Adels. Uh, and another thing we can do is, well, if we have just the real numbers with this action, then we can decompose this, uh, this ZNS set into, as a co-product of smaller ZNS sets. For example, you can, you have the element zero, which is a uh, stable under multiplication with uh, an element of ZNS. And you have the non-zero real numbers, which are also a sub ZNS set. Um, and zero here, the action on zero is trivial. So uh, we really get an, uh, a copy. This is really the terminal object. And this means also that uh, this uh, pre-sheaved topos contains a copy of, uh, of the original pre-sheaves on a ZNS. So uh, it's a covering map, which is a uh, really uh, a disjoint union of smaller toposes. And one of the smaller toposes is the original base topos uh, pre sheaves on ZNS. So, and this corresponds to the decomposition of the double quotients, which is also considered in uh, the article on the scaling side by uh, Conan Konzani, um, which is a, uh, that you first take the finite Adels and the, the component at the real numbers is zero. And then you look at the, a case where the component at the, or the entry at the real numbers is non-zero. And more precisely, there is a decomposition of a discovering space as a, in really very much uh, more uh, smaller parts. So it, it's really a disjoint union of toposes. And uh, so we already said that, that there is a, a copy of the original base topos and then you have also uh, coverings corresponding to the subsets uh, given by the non-zero rationals. And hopefully this gives a bit a simplified picture of what is happening with the scaling site. So uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Okay, so uh, thank you uh, very much for your talk.